We have with us uh, an eminent person in public life, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, who, though he does not need an introduction, will certainly be introducing him in a short while. Before introducing him, I'd like to briefly acquaint him and the rest here with the Center for Contemporary Studies and the Humanities component of the Institute's undergraduate science program, which he thought was the idea. The Center for Contemporary Studies was established by the Indian Institute of Science in 2004. I was fortunate to be present at this creation, and it was intended to be a bridge between humanities and the sciences. Its founder chairman, Professor Raghavendra Gadagra, is an internationally renowned biologist and current president of the Indian National Science Academy, he is the force behind this institution. Over the years, it has introduced the institute community as well as the public at large to eminent people from diverse fields. Some of those who have talked at the center include Dr. Edgar Navatoni, the former president of the European Research Council, Dr. Simon Singh, a very colorful fellow with the uh, Red Indian hairstyle, uh, author, journalist, TV producer, etc., etc. And then Baron Susan Greenfield of the Royal Institute, director of the Royal Institution of Great Britain, Mr. George Shores, he turned up here also. And uh, Professor Parvez Amir Ali Woodboy, Professor of Physics in Wadi Azam University in Islamabad, Professor Meenakshi Mukherjee, uh, formerly uh, International Chairperson Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies. Professor David Shulman of the Institute of Asian and African Studies in the Hebrew University was also here, as also uh, Justice Chairman for the Serving Judge of the Supreme Court. There were many others, but if I start listing them out, that's all I'll be doing. The Center for Contemporary Studies also runs a vibrant production of knowledge program with public participation. The undergraduate science program of the Institute has a strong humanities component in six of its eight semesters, and the Center for Contemporary Studies is actively involved in it. The sixth semester program on introduction to governance is intended to acquaint students with some key issues and challenges to governance in India, and also gives an insight into how government works. The sessions conducted on Saturdays and Sundays in the evenings uh, often the students who are missing their dinner between January and April are very interactive and brings the students face to face with policy makers, senior government officials and constitutional authorities from diverse backgrounds. Finance, infrastructure, the unique identification authority of India, the election commission, security and the judiciary to name a few. The students themselves have surprised us all by their stunning in-depth group presentations, such as India's struggle to stay together, the challenges of putting UID to use, evaluating the Swaj Bharat programs, they were not very happy with it, special status, special states, and the evolution of the election commission, again to name a few. There were so many others. So, oh my God, after telling everybody to put it on. This is Okay, there we are. Um, the individual assignments, on the one thing they would like to see change in India has produced 115 original essays of astonishing depth and variety. On behalf of the CCS and the Institute, I am happy to welcome Mr. Jairam Ramesh to the IAC community this morning and to this program also. Quite a few of the students are here, though they are having their exams. We all know him as a very visible public personality, but he is also very forthright, articulate, and direct to the point person who dares to state what many in this position keep silent about. Too few in public life, as I build him, bother to communicate their considerable accumulated experiences to the public at large. Mr. Jairam Ramesh bucks the trend by being hyper-communicative with the public at large through, the, through his newspaper columns, his books, as well as his public engagements. His commitment to transparency in decision-making is most evident in his latest work Green Signals, Ecology, Democracy, and Growth in India. The books are on display outside, as you may have He has an astonishing capacity to invite our attention to the obvious what we could missed. Why India and China should work together, the internal remittance economy, and why ceremonial academic grounds should be discarded. I think IAC doesn't happily have that. <laughs> he, he is currently Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha from Andhra Pradesh. 
It's very really interesting. I just remember from Andhra Pradesh and last time we had a few days back, we had Rajiv Gaurav and other MP from the Rajya Sabha from Karnataka. This, he is uh, Tata, Chair, uh, Tata Chair Professor Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Distinguished Visiting Fellow Indian School of Business, Senior Fellow of the Center for Politics and Public Policy, Chairman Engagement Committee in Future, Distinguished Visiting Fellow of the Institute of Advanced Sustainable Studies in Potsdam, Global Ambassador, Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. I don't have much to say, another minute that's all. Union Cabinet Minister for Rural Development, Union Cabinet Minister for uh, uh, Environment and Forest and then for Rural Development, Union Minister for, of State uh, for Commerce and Power, Union Minister of State for, uh, yeah, for Commerce, Advisor to the Finance Minister, OSD to the Deputy Chairman, Planning Council, a whole lot of things. It's a huge accumulated experience in government that finally brought him to the ministership and the dramatic things that he was trying to do. And he uh, is a prolific author. Many of us have read him in newspapers and magazines, and he's also written several books. I don't know how we find the time for all that. I'll just name a few. Indo-US Relations, Asia Society, uh, 2000, Globalizing India, Making Sense of Chin India, Legislating for Justice, the making of the 2013 Land Acquisition Law. That's another OUP publication, uh, April 2015. And the latest one, Green Signal Psychology, Democracy and Growth. Mr. Dehram Ramesh is not only a member of the Indian School of Business, but he's a founder of it. And he's also the member of the International Society, uh, International Society of Asia, or rather, Society, International Society of Asia in New York. We are fortunate to have you uh, have Mr. Jairam Ramesh with us today. And it is a great pleasure to invite him to speak to us on ecology, democracy, and the growth in India. And growth in India. Sir. I'm delighted to be back in the Institute of Science campus. Normally, I speak to postgraduates or doctoral students. This is my first experience of speaking to undergraduates at the University of Science. I congratulate you for being the only four-year program to have survived. The Ministry of Retiring is on slot in recent months, uh, and that makes you rather distinctive because you are the only four-year program now in India for quite some time to come. Uh, therefore, there will be a lot riding on you, uh, and if you are successful, I'm sure other universities will have to bear the brunt of HRD's anger, uh, like Ashoka, Shrinada University, uh, and other private universities particularly uh, will revive their four-year programs. Uh, Uday has been after me for quite some time to come here and speak. I was here five months ago at the National Institute for Advanced Studies, and I've come here on many other occasions as well. Uh, it so happened that I was in Bangalore today, and uh, Saturday morning is not exactly the best time to hear about ecology, growth, and democracy, but uh, this was really the only time that I had, and therefore uh, I'm grateful to Ude for having organized this interaction. What I propose to do in the next 25 minutes or so, uh, talk to you about two issues. One is, why is sustainable growth important for India? Uh, and secondly, how do you institutionalize uh, the principles governing sustainable growth? The first question should be obvious, but uh, is no longer can be taken for granted, because there is a very large constituency in India, a political constituency, intellectual constituency, a media constituency, particularly the big papers, uh, which takes the position that for India, sustainability is a luxury, and that what India needs to do uh, is really uh, follow the traditional grow now, pay later model which the U.S. has followed, which the Chinese have followed, which the Brazilians have followed. Uh, and why should India be an exception? India should also follow the Kuznets curve, which is become richer and dirtier. Uh, and then after you become richer, you reach a plateau of dirtiness, and then you start becoming a cleaner economy. And this is 
the environmental Kuznets curve. You must have read about the Kuznets curve in economics. And this is the environmental counterpart to the Kuznets curve. Uh, based on the principle that pollution and prosperity are correlated, you cannot be prosperous without pollution. You cannot be prosperous without deforestation. That's the world experience. So this is the question that needs to be addressed today. But why should India be different at all? Can India be different? And how India should be different? These are three separate issues. So I want to start with the fundamental question of why India should be different. Well, the most apparent, most direct, the most stark reason why we should be different is the demographic reason. We are today 1.25 million people, and by the year 2050, we'll be 1.7 million. We want to add 400 million people, even if by some miracle, the birth rate in India falls below 2.1 in the next couple of years, and all of you decide to be single in your lives, we still want to have 400 million people in the next 35 years. Remember that by 2040, most countries begin to experience population declines, including China. China's population begins to decline from 1.7 billion from 2040. The European countries are already experiencing population declines. And the only two countries that are, the two big countries that are exceptions to the rule are the United States and the United Kingdom. And there is no mystery as to why these two countries are exceptions. That's because of the immigration that helps them to keep the birth rates very high. So India is really unique. There is no country in the world which is going to add one third of its current population in the next 30 years, which is a generation. Now, it is because of this reason that the current generation has to start thinking about the cost of the economic growth that it is following, because sustainability has been defined as the ability of current generations to meet their consumption needs without jeopardizing the capacity of future generations to meet theirs. And if most countries in the world do not have future generations to bother about, we, amongst all countries in the world, have more than a generation. We have, in fact, three, as I said, one third of our population yet to arrive in the next three decades. So the demographic pressure that India is going to witness enforces a certain choice on us. Of course, we need faster growth, and I'll come to that a little later. But we need faster growth in a manner that protects natural resources. Because you don't want growth at the expense of water, air, forests, rivers, land. Because these are the natural resources you're really bequeathing to future generations. And if you're really worried about intergenerational equity, which I'm sure that all of us are, we really have to bother not just about generating faster growth, the manner in which this growth is being generated. So this is the first reason. The second reason why India must be different is uh, because today it's now clear, except to some Republicans in the US, that climate change is for real. Now, there is no scientific controversy over climate change. There may be probability associated with climate change, but there is no uncertainty required as far as many of the manifestations of climate change are concerned. And let me enumerate to you what are some of the manifestations of this climate change in India. This, he used to be a famous professor at the Indian Institute of Science. She's no longer here, she's retired. Sarochana Gargil, who was uh, the wife of Madhav Gargil. And Sarochana had spent a lifetime working on the Indian monsoon. And what she had shown was that over the last hundred years, uh, the Indian monsoon has not changed in any way. The total volume of rainfall is the same. But the time distribution of rainfall has changed, and the frequency of occurrence of extreme events has changed. So the frequency with which uh, drought days occur, the frequency with which flood days occur, the frequency with which abnormal rainfall occurs has increased. And there is no better visible sign of this 
than the rains that Bangalore has been witnessing in the last four days, or North India has witnessed in the last four days. So the monsoon behavior, which still drives the Indian economy, is one of the fundamental characteristics of climate change. Now, agriculture, as some of you who are doing economics would know, agriculture contributes less than 15% of GDP. But in many states of India, almost two-thirds of employment is still in agriculture. And the national level, the level of employment in agriculture has fallen to 50%. But in UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, the share of agriculture in employment is still over 60 percent. So the share of agriculture in GDP has fallen, but the share of agriculture in employment is still very high, and therefore rural prosperity in India is still determined very largely by what happens in the monsoon. And if the monsoon fails, not only does rural prosperity come down, but industrial consumption also comes down. To give you one very visible indicator or index of this is just look for motorcycle sales. When monsoons are good, motorcycle sales are very healthy. When monsoons are bad, motorcycle sales dip. In the last two years, you can see the data. So the monsoon behavior is certainly one very significant indicator of how climate change introduces 120 into India. Second, we have a 7,500 kilometer long coastline, starting from West Bengal in the east and extending all the way up to Gujarat in the west. Nine states of India, 200 million people, 250 million people living in hazardous zones, vulnerable to increase in mean sea levels. Now, if there is one thing that science has proved incontrovertibly, on which there is no controversy in the international community of scientists, climate scientists, it is that mean sea levels have been increasing. And that's why there is a great worry in Maldives and Bangladesh and all these places about these countries getting flooded up. Now, forget Maldives and Bangladesh. That would be a picnic compared to what would happen to the coastal areas of India because we have a population of over 200 million people living in the hazardous areas, starting, as I said, from West Bengal at one end to Gujarat on the other. But this is a second indication of vulnerability. The third index of vulnerability comes because of the behavior of the Himalayan glaciers. We have over 10,000 Himalayan glaciers. Most glaciers today are under retreat. A couple of glaciers are advancing. The Siachen Glacier, some of you may know about the Siachen Glacier, which is the highest battlefield in the world where two armies are locked in combat with each other. Some glaciers are retreating, but at a decelerating rate. And the most uh, classic example of this is the Gangotri Glacier. But most of the 10,000 odd Himalayan glaciers are under retreat. And what this means is that the snow melt, which determines the water flow in the perennial rivers of North India, uh, is now subject to a very high degree of variability. So the glacial melt and the impact that the glacial melt has on the security of water supply is a third indicator of one another. And fourthly, we have the issue of forests. Now, most of our natural resources, most of the coal that we have to extract, most of the iron ore we have to extract, most of the bauxite we have to extract, most of the uranium that is left to be extracted is in rich forest areas. And in fact, in Karnataka, you know, one of the biggest political issues is the, is the extraction of iron ore. And all the iron ore in the state is really in rich forest areas. So we need resources, we need natural resources for faster economic growth. These natural resources are located in rich forest areas. The more resources you extract, the more you are going to end up destroying natural forests. And the more forests you're going to destroy, you're going to add to the problem of global warming because those of you who have done science will know that the best form of carbon sink 
is a national forest. So here are four dimensions of vulnerability to climate change, which no other country has. Some country is vulnerable because of the coastal uh, mean sea levels. Some countries like Brazil or Indonesia are vulnerable because of deforestation. Uh, some countries are vulnerable because of glacial melt. But no country in the world has all dimensions of vulnerability. Monsoon, glaciers, mean sea levels, and deforestation to the extent that India has. So this is the second argument. The first is the demographic argument. The second is the climate change. The third argument, which is compelling India to make a departure from the grow now pay later model, is the public health dimension. Increasingly, there is now evidence to suggest that air pollution, water pollution, chemical contamination, land degradation is having short-term mobility effects and long-term mortality effects. One of, the, one of the biggest centers now, one of the most, in a macabre sense, thriving centers for cancer is Matinda in Punjab. Uh, and trains that come out of Matinda to Delhi and Bombay are called cancer expresses. And that's because of the soil pollution and the runoff from the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, which has reached dangerously high levels in particular. The entire indo gangetic belt, uh, ranging from UP and going all the way up to Assam, is in a carcinogenic area caused by arsenic contamination because of the use of shallow hand pumps. Most of the rural drinking water is groundwater which extracted from shallow hand pumps and arsenic because of the arsenic contamination. The incidence of cardiovascular diseases, 25% of children below the age of 10 in the city of Bangalore are affected by cardiovascular diseases. This is, these are independent studies done by public health organizations. And as you know, Delhi now has the dubious distinction of being the most polluted city in the world. So we are beginning to see both the short-term morbidity effects in terms of impact on public health and long-term mortality effects, particularly in the form of effects on cancer particularly, caused by environmental distress, namely water pollution, air pollution. And, and the fourth and final reason why India must question the grown out pay, pay later model is because increasingly it is becoming apparent that issues of environment are not as they are in the Western countries issues of lifestyles, issues of maintaining a two car family, issues of living in suburbia but basically issues concerning livelihoods. I take you back 40 years ago. Madhav Gadya and Ram Guha, uh, who have worked on this in this very institute, wrote a history of the Chipko movement, which was modern India's first environmental movement. And the Chipko movement, those of you who are from Uttarakhand will recall, that the Chipko movement was basically a movement of ill women to protect the forest resources of Uttarakhand from rapacious contractors. This was not a lifestyle issue. These were poor women who were protecting their access to forests because that access determined their daily availability of fuel wood, fodder, small timber, bamboo, and other such minor forest produce which gave them daily sustenance. So whether it is forests for tribal areas, whether it is the protection of water sources, whether it is the protection of land, these are increasingly issues of livelihood. In the last 10 years, we have seen Singh, Nandigra in West Bengal, Kalinga Nagar in Odisha, <coughs> Tappal and Bhatta Parsol in Uttar Pradesh. A variety of such examples that we can take in state after state where Local people are <coughs> for the protection of either forests 
or for the protection of their water sources or for the protection of their lands. Not because they want to preserve their lifestyles, but basically because they want to protect their livelihoods. This, I think, is somewhat unique uh, in the world context. So, to summarize the question, why India should be different? Why should India take a different path? Why India should not believe in the environmental Kuznetska? And why India must look at a different trajectory of economic growth uh, is, in my view, anchored in these four arguments. The demographic argument, the climate change argument, the public health argument, and the climate argument. Now, let's next turn to the research, which is that if we recognize that India needs to be different, what does India have to do to be different? Well, the starting point of this is a recognition that you need economic growth. I don't think anybody is advocating a return to a situation where we are comfortable with a 4% or a 5% rate of growth. There may be some romantics in our country who believe that low growth means no environmental <coughs> damage, no ecological damage, although that assumption also is not, strictly speaking, valid. Because as uh, Mrs. Gandhi, so Indira Gandhi said in Stockholm in 1972, uh, the worst form of pollution is poverty. And it leads to land degradation and it leads to a whole set of other undesirable ecological consequences. So I think. In India, there is a fair degree of political consensus that you need faster economic growth. That we grew at 3.5% per year from 1950 to 1980. We grew at 5.5% per year from 1980 to 2000. And we have grown at 6.5% per year from 2000 to 2015. So 3.5% per year has gone to 5.5% per year, which has gone to 6.5% per year. And now the objective is to further increase this to 8%, 9% per year. Now, so the need for economic growth is not a question, simply because it is only through this growth that you're going to generate the jobs. 10 million Indians look for jobs every year, and you have to generate those jobs every year. And therefore, you need the fast growth. You need the rapid economic trajectory. And those of you who remember, these growths are not simple growths. These are compound growth rates. So the power of compounding is very important. You can argue, what is the difference between 7% and 5%? After all, it's only 2 percentage points. And I've heard people argue on this. But remember, a 7% rate of compound growth means that an economy doubles in 10 years time. But a 5% rate of growth compound means that an economy doubles 14 years, in 14 years time. Now, 10 years and 14 years may not be long, but when you go for the next round, then it becomes 20 years and 28 years. And that's how the compounding effect takes place. So these are not games in arithmetic. These are very, very important figures that we need to recognize are central to our economic planning. So we start on the assumption that we need rapid economic growth. We need to sustain an 8%, 8.5% rate of economic growth. And economic growth, uh, everybody has told us, uh, the world is yet to find a way of delivering fast growth without investment. Investment is crucial for economic growth. And in this investment, obviously there's a mix of public investment, there's a private investment. The mix of what is public and what is private will change at different points of time. But we have yet to discover a way of growing without investing. Well, that's as simple as that. Now, if we, if we therefore ask ourselves the next question, that having recognized that we need this rapid economic growth, how do you ensure that because of the four factors that I uh, explained in detail to you at some point, how do you ensure that this growth does not impose an intolerable ecological burden? Now, one of the problems is measurement. GDP as we measure it today is gross domestic product. It's not real domestic product. It's gross domestic product 
And NNP, which is net domestic product, is net of obsolescence of physical capital. Very important. Economists will tell you that we do not account for obsolescence or use of natural resources. What we do is account for obsolescence of physical capital. So GDP as we measure, when I say the economy is growing at 7% per year, it tells you nothing about well-being. It doesn't tell you anything about welfare. It just tells you that the sum total of goods and services has increased by 7% per year. That's all there is to GDP. We do not repeat, uh, report, no country except Norway now, reports GDP adjusted for the use of natural capital. That's a very important uh, figure, very important fact that we must remember. That if we don't measure, we can't manage. I mean, you don't know what to manage if you're not measuring. So we really are not measuring. What we are measuring is the wrong thing. But till such a time that we do not have an index in place, and I'm hopeful that in the next couple of years, we will have a set of national accounts which will report not just GDP as conventionally measured, but also GDP that accounts for the use of natural capital that values ecosystem services, that values biodiversity, that values environmental costs and benefits, and therefore adjusts this normal figure that you see every day bandied about in the newspapers. But till such a time that we do not have a metric, we really have to go by certain rules, certain uh, norms that we set for ourselves to ensure that the growth process does not become ecologically devastating. How do we do this? Now, what I want to suggest to you is there are four pillars on which an ecology-friendly, high-growth strategy can move forward. The first pillar is the pillar of regulation. Without regulation, we can argue about the instruments of regulation, but without regulation, which means without laws, without standards, without regulation, We are not going to be able to make much progress, and we are not going to be able to protect our natural resources. So the first thing that we need is a recognition, that we need an edifice of regulation. Now, India has been very fortunate that we have had a very progressive, over the last 40, 50 years, we have built a very progressive portfolio of environmental laws and regulations. We have a Forest Conservation Act going back to 1980, which was formulated in the wake of the Chipko movement. We have the Environment Protection Act of 1986 that was formulated in the wake of humanity's worst industrial catastrophe in Bhopal in December 1984. We have the Forest Rights Act of 2006, which was uh, formulated in the backdrop of armed violence that had rocked most of Eastern India is Central India. And of course, we have banks with airs. So the portfolio, the structure of our environmental regulation is very progressive. Unfortunately, the problem lies in its enforcement. And it is because of our inability or unwillingness to enforce the standards that we have that you find that rivers in India have become sewers. Uh, that you find that many of our cities uh, have the most polluted air, if also the most polluted water. And you find that in spite of the laws that we have, we have rampant deforestation taking place in the name of extraction of natural resources. So the first pillar is regulation. Because without regulation, you are not going to be able to enforce a pattern of behavior on economic agents which will fulfill a certain broader national perspective. Because environment, remember, is the classic example in an economics textbook of market failure. And when there is a market failure, you need regulation. And that, I think, is the first starting point. Second, you need a set of institutions. 
Because regulations without institutions is not going to make much sense. So you need institutions. Well, what type of institutions? You need institutions that appraise. You need institutions that monitor. You need institutions that enforce. You need institutions of the executive, and you need institutions of the judiciary. Because remember, in our country, very often, the executive takes a back seat for a variety of reasons. And it is then that the judiciary steps in. And many of our landmark environmental moves have not been because of executive action, I have to admit. It has, begun, it has been because of judicial intervention. When the entire city of Delhi shifted to CNG, 7,000 buses moved to CNG, it was because of a public interest litigation fired by MC Mehta and Sudhita Narayan. We sat on it for 15 years, but when the Supreme Court mandated that within six months all the buses must go on to CNG, the buses went on to CNG. But nothing is more frightening to a political leader or to an administrator than the prospect of being held up for contempt of court and put behind bars, which has happened recently. A former chief secretary of the state was put behind bars for a couple of days for flouting an order of the Supreme Court. So the second set of, the second principle is a set of institutions. Institutions both in the executive and institutions both in the judiciary, which will enforce the laws, the rules, the regulations, the standards that we have, and which have not been observed to the extent that they should have. Third, I think we need a rethink at the political processes by which decisions are made. Now, for too long, many of these decisions that we are talking about are seen to be technocratic in nature. But they are no longer purely technocratic in nature. I became a very unpopular man in this campus because Professor Padmanam, a very distinguished biotechnologist, and I got into a spat on genetically modified brinjol. B.T. Brinjong, five years ago. Incidentally, he's a great friend of mine. I traveled with him yesterday from Bangalore, from Delhi to Bangalore. But I found he and I on opposite ends because Professor Padmanabhan still takes the view, and I respect his view, that there are matters that only science should decide. And I took the view that in many issues, it's not pure science that decides. The civil society also must have a voice. When Fukushima happened, we can no longer take the view that nuclear power is a matter to be decided only by nuclear scientists. And so when the issue of Bt Brinjal came up, when India's first, the world's first genetically modified food crop was going to be introduced, I took the view that, look, this is not just a scientific issue. We must hear all stakeholders in society. Uh, and then at the end of that process, a moratorium was imposed, much to the uh, irritation of scientists like Professor Padmanabhan and Mr. Vijay. Dr. Vijay is still here? He's still here. Oh, this, this used to be the uh, this used to be the citadel of genetically modified technology. Uh, it still is, I'm sure. But uh, the what this demonstrates is that in these issues, to adopt a very narrow technocratic approach may in fact weaken the foundations of democratic processes. And you really come fair and square against this argument time and time again. When a company goes to mine bauxite from a hill that is considered sacred to the tribals, should you allow the bauxite to be mined? Or should you allow the tribals the right to protect that property? It's the same thing like saying, suppose under Ayodhya there was a coal mine. Would you allow coal mining in Ayodhya? <laughs> I mean, this was the argument that was given to me by a few hundred lectures uh, in Sikkim, who said that the sacred burial grounds of Buddhists were going to be inundated by two hydro projects that the government is going to put up. Uh, and uh, we should not allow it. 
So does democracy mean only listening to the voices of the majority, or does it also mean being sensitive to the voices of minorities? And here I give you two examples, the Vedanta example in Niamgiri and the Lepcha example in Sikkim, where we were forced to listen to people who were numerically not preponderant, who were outvoted in any you know, referendum, but whose cultural practices and modes of living were in inextricably linked to the preservation of national resources. So I think in addition to regulations, in addition to institutions, the political processes also had to change very significantly. And that change in the political process has to start from a recognition of the crops. And that is why in the Forest Rights Act particularly, or in the Land Acquisition Act, which is right now the subject of much political debate and discussion, we took the view that if the Gram Sabha, which is really the very foundation of democracy in India, is not in sync with what the government wants to do, or with what economic agents want to do, then we should just abandon what we do. Now, this is not uh, a popular, or this is not a generally accepted uh, principle to take, but I think as we move ahead, uh, the more and more you're able to strengthen democratic processes at the local level, the greater the chances of you're able to find a growth strategy that people find a buy-in into. Otherwise, you're perennially going to be locked in into a cycle of agitation and counter-agitation. And fourth principle, I would say, uh, is that we need better information, we need better scientific evaluation, we need more honest assessment of risks and uncertainties. <coughs> I found, for example, in the BT Print John case, there was no scientific consensus itself. The scientific community itself was divided on whether we should introduce genetically modified food crops. In the case of nuclear technology, the nuclear community itself was divided whether we should go in for a particular reactor. If you notice, if you, if you remember the debate that took place uh, when we signed our nuclear agreement uh, with the United States, uh, one set of uh, nuclear scientists were arguing very vehemently for it, and another set of nuclear scientists arguing vehemently against it. So the scientific community itself does not have a consensus. It becomes very difficult uh, in the popular mind, in the political establishment, uh, to create you know, so I think the search for the middle ground, the search for a strategy that marries growth and ecological factors will be based on these four pillars. The pillars of first, regulations, second, the pillar of institutions, third, the pillar of decentralized political processes, and fourth, the pillar of greater and greater scientific transparency, uh, scientific accountability, scientific responsibility, because in many of these issues we must recognize that there is, after all, a fair degree of professional expertise that is going to be involved in the evaluation. Let me end here uh, by saying that we are today at a most crucial time of our nation's economic history. Uh, we are at a time when there is growth triumphancy, when there is today an overall environment in which the primacy of growth over everything else is being repeated day after day after day. So we have a historic uh, moment ahead of us. If we go the path of a single-minded pursuit of economic growth, I would suggest that we stand the danger of jeopardizing the very foundations of our ecological system. <coughs> On the other hand, if we are a little careful, if we listen to different voices, if we listen to voices of civil society that are being stifled day after day, we may end up getting a growth strategy that may not be as single-mindedly obsessed with economic growth, but which would still deliver an 8% rate of growth, but which would protect your forests, protect your water, protect your air, protect your natural resources, not only for yourself, but also for future generations, which is very important. So I think this is the choice uh, ahead of us as we embark on the next 25, 30 years of economic growth. In the last 50 years, we have created 
the edifice. That edifice has served us well. It has not delivered spectacular economic growth of the type that China has had or South Korea has had. It has delivered steady economic growth. But it has delivered steady economic growth and it has also helped preserve some of our natural resources, not in a perfect way, but to a very large extent. And now, if we are really want to ramp up our growth, object our growth objectives and ambitions, I think we will be doing that in a manner that will actually jeopardize the long-term prospects of economy. Because in my view, economic growth, if it's not inclusive, cannot be sustained for too long. And economic growth, if it's not sustainable ecologically, cannot be sustained for too long because it runs into the barrier that I mentioned to you in terms of public health and climate change. So let me end here and take whatever questions that you have. Questions, may I just request you to keep it to the point and one question per person until we come back to you. <laughs> so we can kick off. There. Um, yeah, that's you. So you spoke about okay, ecosystem you want to come services up. and uh, acceptable risks, sir. So one of the issues I wanted to ask you about is how do you value them and when do you say that a certain risk is acceptable, not only for the current generation but also for the future generation because as of now you can compare your ecosystem services and the environment like a cake but you don't know how big the cake is so how would you slice it accordingly? I think the risks are going to be assessed only as part of the political process. Um, we have to recognize that many of these risks that we are talking about are not purely scientific in nature, but they have to be accepted by society at large. If people don't want to eat genetic, transgenic brinjal, then we shouldn't be introducing transgenic brinjal, right? Uh, if a very large majority of people in Kulamkula do not want a nuclear power plant, then we have no business putting up a nuclear plant. Of course, we put it up. <laughs> we did it. You know, we did it. But the point I want to make to you is that that's why it's ecology, growth, and democracy. The framework is democracy. Ecology and growth are not the objectives in themselves. The objective is democracy. The objective is to strengthen the democratic institutions. And the only way you can do this is to get full public participation in many of the institutions. Mother Gadgil produced a report on the Western Guards. Some of you may have followed the debate on the Western Guards. Uh, and what did he do? You know, he could have sat and a bunch of scientists could have looked at Landsat imagery, uh, source mapping, and said, OK, these are areas that are go, these are areas that should be no go, and this is how Western Ghat should be protected. No. He went, he spent 14 months traveling all over the Western Ghats, he spoke to the Gram Sabhas, he spoke to local elected representatives, and produced a report for the preservation of the Western Ghats, which I thought was the right way of going about it. Because this is a democratic process. This is not a technocratic process. So risk can be quantified. To the extent that they can be quantified, they should be quantified. But not always are the risks known now. And not always, in most instances, the risks can be quantified. Thank you. Thanks for that very crisp talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was really happy when you started off your talk uh, talking about demography and demography and how we are going to have uh, one third more population in the next 30 years. And when you gave the four pillars, I was slightly disappointed that you didn't address that. I mean, is it something that we cannot control? Because population is obviously, I mean, that's the elephant in the room, but no one talks about it. Why is it uh, that no one talks about the elephant? And is there any way we can? Maybe talk about that 2.1. Okay, I'll tell you why we can't control. Even if you decide not to marry, we have more. 
the key demographic variable is total fertility rate. When a country falls below a total fertility rate of 2.1, then a generation after that population begins to get stable. 2.1 because you know a couple reproduces itself. 0.1 is because you know cohort, somebody will be a spinster, somebody will be a bachelor. So, so 2.1 is the mathematics of the total fertility rate. So when countries fall below 2.1, they come into the zone of demographic transition. And after a generation or two, which means about 40 years, population begins to get stable and start declining. Kerala reached 2.1 in 1988. So today now, in Kerala, you have teachers but no students. Uh, so Kerala is virtually like Germany or Japan today. Tamil Nadu reached 2.1 in 1994. Andhra reached 2.1 in 2000. And in the last 10 years, a number of states have reached 2.1. Which means, <clears throat> 40 years from now, the population of those states will start beginning to get stable. It will still increase, but it will start beginning to get stable and start falling. However, we have Bihar, we have UP, we have Madhya Pradesh, we have Jharkhand, we have Osa has reached 2.1, uh, we have Rajasthan, and surprise of surprise, we have Gujarat, which has modern state, where the total fertility rate is still 2.3. So there is a demographic <coughs> momentum because of these states. That's one reason why this population is going to increase over the next 30 years. The second reason is, you already have a bulge. You're already at 1.25 billion. So even if population is growing at 1% per year, which is you know, the Japanese growth rate, because your base is 1.25 billion, you're still going to be adding a very substantial number. You'll still be adding 8 million people every year. So instead of 400 million people, you will add 200 million people. So the, the point of demographics is that India's base is very high. It's 1.25. So even a 1% growth on 1.25 billion translates to a very high increment. Right now, our population growth is slightly below 2%. So which means that, as I said, the, the addition is about 400 million people over the next 25 years. So even if all the states of India were to reach, India will reach 2.1 as a whole by the year 2025. Even if after India reaches 2.1 in 2025, because of two reasons, because of these large North Indian states, and because of the base being very large, we will still be 1.7 million by the year There is no way, there is, all of you will be here in 2050, I won't be here, but in 2050, mark my words, we will be 1.7 million. We cannot, we cannot run away from that reality. That's the only thing that is certain in India today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a question there. Yeah. Uh, first of all, appreciate everything you've said. I would challenge you on your four points. So regulation, <laughs> regulation, uh, and I'll give a, an example. Regulation, we have EIA notification. Institutions, we have a wealth of operators who claim to be very expert in generating EIAs. Um, democratic uh, approval procedures at the Gram Sabha level, well, we see how those are in gen generally co-opted time and time again in favor of people being bought off, leaders being bought off, there's a general acceptance that, oh, Sarkar will do what Sarkar wants to do. And then professional expertise, we've got legions of people in institutions like NERI, I'll pick on one that's my current opponent, who will claim to produce 553-page reports filled with volumes of science, some of which have been plagiarized, some of which have been copied from Wikipedia. But we've got all we've got all these four parts. Or certain people can claim we've got all these four parts, and yet 
that's going to lead us on a destructive growth path. So my challenge is that I think you're, the four sort of controlling agents don't can't control an overarching political imperative to grow destructively. And I, I would, in, particularly in the current context, I would challenge you to respond. Well, yeah, I'll respond. It's very important for you to raise. You are 100% right. The four principles today exist in some form. And the problems that you have identified are real problems. You have public hearings in India. Where you have hearings, there's no public. And when it's public, there are no hearings. <laughs> the very organization that you mentioned, Niri, it's a matter of shame. I had to pull them up that they would put, do a cut and paste job on AI. All these issues are well known. What is the answer? The answer is to close down environmental regulation. The answer is to close down institutions. The answer is to bypass Lok Sabha's. The answer is to avoid scientific institutions. No. The answer is, however imperfect they may be today, you set in process a system of checks and balances that strengthens these four principles. So and hence, well, let me give you some examples. Hence, you have environmental regulations that are smart environmental regulations. From your accent, I gather that you are from the US. Let me give you a US example. How did the United States control acid rain? In the 1990s, sulfur dioxide emissions was a huge problem in the US. The US didn't send out an army of inspectors to control acid rain. They introduced a market-based instrument of trade in, of cap and trade. And today, nobody talks about acid rain in the US. So it's how you do the regulation. The problem in India is when you have regulations, you have an army of regulators. And when you have regulators, you know what happens. So, but that does not mean you give up regulations. What you need to do is to understand how best do you enforce the regulations. Institutions. Yes, government institutions are imperfect. But does that mean that you give up government institutions? You have to reform the government institutions. You have to create the right set of incentives for the government institutions. That's why we set up the National Green Tribunal, which is right now in the news today almost every day, for doing its job. I mean, India is the only country in the world where an institution gets headlines when it does its job. <laughs> the National Green Tribunal is doing its job every day. But every day it's under attack. That's an example of an institution. We are one of the few countries in the world which has a national green tribunal. That was an example of institutional innovation. Now, political process. What is the answer to this democracy? Is to strengthen democratic functioning. In some states, I agree with you, Gram Sabhas don't function. But in some states, Gram Sabhas function. Now, what was the Supreme Court decision in Vedanta? It was a historic decision that was taken about eight months ago. The Supreme Court said no project in a forest area where tribals are living will be allowed to be implemented without the permission of the Gram Sabha. It was a historic decision that was taken. Gram Sabha can be bought over? Yes, Gram Sabha can be bought over. Have Gram Sabha been bought over? Yes, they have been bought over. Have Gram Sabha resisted? Yes, they have resisted. So the evidence your man is mixed. But the answer to the imperfections that you have correctly identified is not to abandon them, but to set in process a reform movement in each of those institutions, rules, democratic processes, scientific organizations. And I quite agree with you. The overall environment today is one of looking at environment as a roadblock. That you know this is something that we can do with come to it after 20 years. But this is the only route that we know. There is no other route. It's a frustratingly slow route. But this is the only route we can take. And I, I think people in most unimaginable situations score unimaginable victories. This young girl, 26-year-old girl, Priya Pillay, who was offloaded from a plane when she was going to London 
to give evidence against, not give evidence, to speak to some members of parliament against a coal mine in Madhya Pradesh. Who would have thought that a judge of the Delhi High Court would have the courage to say that she is not a security risk, government should restore her passport, and government should desist from doing what it has done. Judiciary stood up. So I wouldn't be as pessimistic as you are. I think you should soldier on. Let me take a question there. <coughs> and the question is, who regulates who in India? You spoke of Gandhi so much. Gandhi spoke of need and greed. I have a question. There are certain institutions and forces in our country which prevent all these positive sides. Let me take an example here. These two pages of any paper. Every newspaper in India but one full page for advertisement board. <laughs> and what we keep the women and the victims. So my question is, why not women in our country protest all these structures? One person's dream is destroying the needs of millions of people in India. Not this only, we have example I will show you. You must have seen every newspaper. How many lakh, lakhs of rupees are spent as an economy minister, and one minister, how many forests and trees have been destroyed to produce this? These are the questions, structural questions we need to address. We need to have many of these structures, and in our vertical democracy, it is not possible. How do we? Well, you raise a very interesting and very important <laughs> All movements of ecological protection in India have been led by people. All of them. You go back 300 years to the protection of the Kejri tree by the Bishnoi tribe in Juru district of Rajasthan. It was a movement led by people. The Chipko movement was a movement led by people. The Liamgiri movement was a movement led by people. All the great environmental activists of India Meena Bhatka, Sandana Shiva, Sunita Narayan, at least you know, the urban, whom the urban middle classes know about, now we have been they're all women. And it's not a coincidence because access to water, access to forests, access to land has very strong gender dimensions. It's the women who collect fuel wood. It's the women who collect fodder. It's the women who collect mahua, karanja, sal, neem. It's the women who do this in forest areas, in tribal communities. So I, uh, the gender dimension of ecology, which has been documented also in by Kumar and Madan Ganjil in their book on the Chippo movement, um, it is very, very strong. It's very striking. And that is one that gives me the hope that actually government will not be as insensitive uh, to the cries of the public. You know, when you're from Kerala, Silent Valley. I forgot to give you the classic example from your own state. Silent Valley. So with the Kumari. <coughs> with the Kumari was one of the great figures of the Silent Valley movement. But men also, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the leaders were all women. And I, Karnataka, Nandana Swami's daughter is now one of the big leaders. Yes, so, another political element, the guy asked in Karnataka, the other day there was a meeting of 26 pairs of women who are the presidents and secretaries of Gran And they met together. They had a problem, a common problem. They said, the local MA, MLAs and MPs always interfere and make us this the is a problem. Say, well, this is a problem. Therefore, we cannot sign any check and the, nothing works. This political. But you know, today what has happened? Karnataka is now going to have panchayat elections. A couple of big rules. 50% reservation for women. 50%? I was in Gujarat last week. 50% reservation. Bihar, 50% reservation. I mean, now. Across the country, local bodies, well, in fact, my party is finding problem identifying women. Fifty <laughs> percent women. It's a huge revolution, I'm telling you. But this creates a tension between the 
Gram Sabha and the MLA. It creates a tension between the local body and elected representatives. It does, it does. Um, but in states like Karnataka, West Bengal, Maharashtra, Gujarat, sufficient power has been devolved on the local bodies. And you do not see this type of conflict that you see in other North Indian states. You know, in, in states like Bihar and UP, first time when I you was know, a minister, I went to some village in 10 years ago. Suddenly I was introduced to one guy who came in a denim and a t-shirt. And so he said, my, my PS told me, sir, he's the MP. He look like an MP also. Who is he? What is MP? He said, Mushyapati. SP who comes without a uniform. Sarpanchpati. So there, there, there is this phenomenon in some parts of India also. But I tell you, the 73rd and 74th event has transformed the face of Indian politics. And it is creating these conflicts. And I, for one, do not believe that conflicts are bad for us. I think it is through this process of conflicts that many of the contradictions will get resolved. If Gram Sabhas, women Gram Sabhas stand up in Andhra, for example, women Gram Sabhas have stood up. Today, women Gram Sabhas are standing up for anti liquor movements. The MPs are objecting, the MLAs are objecting, but the Gram Sabhas are not objecting. So I think the answer lies in strengthening the institutions of democratic decentralization. We take a question there. So when we talk about, I mean, when there is a complaint against the uh, of an ec ecologically degraded, degrading activity happening, is there a way to check its genuinity? Because there have been a lot of claims about vested interests acting in uh, India, which are bringing in uh, concerns which do not really exist or which do not matter as much, uh, just to hamper the development of India. And what's more concerning is in all these climate change uh, conventions that we have, international climate change, the, the responsibility to reduce the carbon footprint and other such measures, the burden is transferred on countries like India and developed countries take lesser responsibility on themselves. So are, is that a serious concern of Western, Western, Western interests acting in India? Well, you know, it's a natural reaction that, and by the way, what you have articulated is the traditional government of India point of view. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you guys have let out CO2 for the last 150 years, and you guys have created global warming, so we don't have anything to do, you guys do it. Forgetting that the guys who are paying the price of that is India. The vulnerability is maximum in India. So we cannot sit back and say, you guys clean up, we won't do anything. So there is there is a vulnerability argument which militates against what you are saying. The second argument is that in India, the denominator is always very big, remember. So when you have a per capita thing in India, it's bound to be low. So when you divide our total emissions by 1.25 billion, which is increasing by 10 million every year, India is bound to be the lowest per capita. So we go and tell the world, your per capita is 15 tons of CO2, we are 2 tons of CO2. It's a very powerful argument, but it's also very unfair because there are 300 million people in India whose carbon footprint is the same as the footprint of the European countries. And we are using the lack of access to commercial electricity of 500 million people as a smokescreen to preserve a high resource intensive lifestyle. So we talk of equity between countries which is a good thing to do, argumentative, nice argumentation to put the other guys on the defense. But the real thing is we have to look inwards. We have to look at our own equity domestically. And there is huge inequality in consumption. 
the very same Gandhi whom he quoted, the very same Gandhi. By the way, one thing about Gandhi I must tell you. Gandhi has never said all the things that are often attributed to him. <laughs> but it sounds nice, so we say Gandhi said it. There's need and greed. You know, that the world has enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. He never said it. But, you know, it's now the, the most famous quotation of Gandhi. Similarly, Gandhi is supposed to have said once that if India were to industrialize like England, then the world will have no place for India. He's supposed to have said like this in 50, 100 years, 70 years ago. But he never said it. But nevertheless, the fact is, the, if we follow the same energy intensive model, which the Western economies have followed, if we follow the same model of urbanization that Western economies have followed, then we are bound to end up with the same levels of emissions. So can we make a change? That's the issue. Should we be going in for a horizontal model of urbanization as opposed to a vertical model? Just to give you an example. How much should you invest in public transport vis-a-vis -vis private transport? When private passenger car sales dip from 2 million to 1.8 million, we define it as recession. <laughs> but actually, 2 million to 1.8 million may not be bad from an ecological point of view. You know? So the choices that we make in transport, in industry, in agriculture, very, very crucial. And the path on which we are today, we will, by the year 2030, our emissions will be equal to what the US emissions are. Remember this. India has not caused the problem. But in the next 15 years, India will cause the problem. So in economics, there are two concepts, stock and flow. You've heard about stock and flow, right? So India has not contributed to the stock. But the flow is increasingly India's contribution. And that's why we have to be a little careful. We're not only hurting the world, but more importantly, we're hurting ourselves. We take a question there, you. Yeah, yeah. Sir, I'd like to know your standpoint about what did you what would you say about sorry, sorry. I would like to know your views about conservation versus livelihood. Conservation versus livelihood. Because I uh, I'm doing my field work in Bhitar Kanika. It's an Odisha. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and there are this uh, 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 conflict is going on in that region uh, regarding stopping the banning the fishing. And these people used to depend on the fishing. Now the problem is uh, now the issue has come between conservation versus livelihood. They are fighting for their livelihood, and the forest people are talking about the conservation. So, what would be your standpoint on this? Well, it's a tough one. <laughs> Well, you know, um, if you protect environment and destroy livelihoods, then you're not creating friends for the environment. All successful models of environmental intervention have either protected livelihoods or given alternative livelihoods to people. So, in our eagerness to preserve ecological heritage, which is natural, we cannot forget the fact that ultimately human beings count. Tigers don't vote, but human beings vote. <laughs> so we have to be a little <coughs> sensitive to those needs. Three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, I went to Kudrebuk. And the issue was whether to declare Kudremuk as a tiger reserve or not. <coughs> I first went to Kudremuk when I was in my case, and I declared it as a tiger reserve. We will have a tiger reserve. Very large type of population, very good forest area. And one way of protecting it from iron ore mining was to declare it as a tiger reserve. <laughs> <laughs> but within three months, I had an agitation on my hands from the locals. 
who said their livelihoods will be threatened. They were being evicted from the Udrimuk area, and that they needed not just compensation, but they required alternative livelihoods as well. And that really is the crux of the issue. The same issue is being, being done in uh, uh, Bihar Hills, the Soligas, the Soligar tribes. So in area, Bita Kanika, Gahir Mata, all these places, Chilka, these are all areas that, you know, uh, we've had this issue, that you have people, uh, you want to protect natural resources, you want to protect forests, you want to protect water, you want to protect wetlands, but uh, Chilka, another example, not very far from Bita Kanika, you want to protect India, Asia's largest wetland, but fishermen are saying, what about our fishing rights? That's a tough one. It's, a, it's, it's something that does not admit of an either or us. It's something that is very, very complex and it's something that requires engagement at the local level over a sustained period of time to create partnerships between local communities and local resources. If those partnerships are not there, then you are not going to create a sustainable model of environmental intervention. You just cannot say that close the forests. I mean, you know, the Indian Forest Service, every forester, you respect us all our friends, <laughs> every forester wants to close our forests because the anchor of forest management in India is the 1927 Indian Forest Act. And the 1927 Indian Forest Act is based on a very simple principle that anybody who goes into a forest is a criminal. <laughs> and thousands of cases in Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, thousands of cases against tribals who go in to collect fuel wood fodder and smart timber. So that is one model. The Forest Rights Act that's why the Forest Rights Act model, I would request you to look at it. The Forest Rights Act model is the right way to go. What it does is, it recognizes the rights of the forest dweller to cultivate forest land, not private land, forest land. And every 14 lakh forest dwellers in the last five years now have been given free pattas. Much to the consternation and anger and opposition of the forest department. They hate it. But it had to be done. Because you had these people living in forest areas saying what about our livelihoods? So I think uh, your, uh, the question that you raise is fundamental. It's being faced in area after area, Sindhipur is another area in Odisha which faces this conflict. And the only answer I can give you is, if you follow the Forest Rights Act in letter and spirit, if you provide not just compensation but alternative livelihoods, the chances of your getting local cooperation for what you're doing are far better. We'll take a question there. Uh, just thinking about the metric uh, of, uh, you know, quantifying the uh, environmental damage which we have caused through growth, uh, you described it, you know that, but it appears that uh, India as a developing country, we, we, how much harm we have caused to the environment in the process of growth, we need it much more than uh, any other country. So is that a luxury we cannot afford right now? I mean, only the developing countries like Norway have... Could you restate it? You hear Yeah. See, you, you described that the uh, metric which we have to quantify with respect to the GDP. Yes. Uh, that the developing Scandinavian countries like Norway have it. Uh, it appears that in, in India we have, like, uh, right now we need it much more to just to quantify how much damage we have caused. And if we, we, if we do any efforts to, you know, uh, go, go towards sustainable development, we would need it to, you know, quantify our uh, efforts. So is that a luxury we are not able to afford right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the measurement is very important. Very, very important. Because if you don't measure, you can't model. If you can't model, you can't manage. See? Now, how do you measure it? That's the real issue. And this has uh, this has been a subject that has been discussed 
time and time again. Amartya Sen has uh, written books on how do you measure GDP to account for health and education. Uh, Partha Dasgupta, uh, who those of you who are interested in ecological issues must read Partha Dasgupta, who is the world's authority on environmental economics. He's a guru, so to speak. And he's worked on measurement of GDP. Uh, first of all, he says GDP is a wrong measure. Uh, he says you cannot, you cannot, you can't adjust GDP. You have to look at net wealth, and that you account for both the benefit as well as the cost. If you protect a forest, you get an ecological benefit. Uh, if you pollute a river, it's an ecological cost. And therefore, he has worked out what are what is the framework for measuring costs and benefits of ecological services, payment for ecosystem services. Some people at the Indian Institute of Science also have worked on this, at the Center for Ecological Studies, they have been involved in this. But as yet, barring Norway and one or two small countries, no country really has the courage to put out what the true state of economic growth is that is measured, which reflects environmental costs and environmental benefits. Uh, it will take us another three, four years before we, if at all, if we are actually going to do it. But, you know, uh, if the international community were to ask us to do it, perhaps we might do it. Uh, but there is no internationally accepted commonly agreed framework for measurement, unlike that of GDP, which is a you know, UN mandated system. We do not have that for green growth itself. One question. Sir, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one question to the Kodakul of nuclear. So, it was during, uh, the Soviet Union uh, has been, uh, been helping India for establishing the Kodakul nuclear power plant. So, under your, uh, means when you have been a minister, the, have you discussed with the Grand Sabahs or do you try to stop it based on the common local people? <laughs> and the other question is that, uh, pertaining to, uh, summing up to his question, that uh, most, uh, not most of our people, less than 50% of their NGOs have been uh, funded by maybe, maybe Western intelligence. So, so, so uh, do you aware <coughs> of that or do you take any steps? Or? See, Kodam Kodam is a particularly Kodam uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kodam uh, goes back to the late 80s when we had an agreement with the Soviet Union. Then Soviet Union. And ever since then, you know, it's been being implemented now, the first unit has been commissioned, the second unit is about to be commissioned. The Kurum Kulam issue became all the more um, urgent after Chernobyl first, and then after Fukushima. Was the Gram Sabha consulted? No. Should the Gram Sabha have been consulted? Yes. Why was the Gram Sabha not consulted? Well, nuclear energy is seen to be, you know, a matter of national prestige, national pride, beyond democratic politics and so on and so forth. But that's changing, by the way. That's changing. Today there are op opposition, not just in Kurukul, but in Chicago, uh, or in Gujarat, even in Gujarat. Even in Gujarat, for a Westinghouse plant, the local village in Bhavna gave a representation to Mr. Obama, an online petition to Mr. Obama, saying that the U.S. should not support this nuclear power. So that's changing. But nuclear power illustrates the cruel dilemmas we face in this proceeding debate. And I must tell you where I stand. The environmentalists who hailed me as a hero painted me as a villain because of my stand on nuclear energy. If India were to abandon coal, like everybody is saying, because coal mining is dirty, coal creates a lot of health problems, it devastates land, how is India going to generate electricity? That's the real issue. 
can a country of 1.7 billion depend only on solar? Can it depend only on biogas? Can it depend only on wind? Or can it depend on the Gandhian solution of not using electricity? <laughs> not possible. So you need electricity. Now, in today's day and age, we rank energy based on the CO2 footprint. The energy source that has the highest CO2 footprint gets the lowest value. Nuclear energy has no CO2 footprint. Paradoxically, paradoxically, you will not like it, I know. The general sentiment here seems to be anti-nuclear. Paradoxically, from an environmental point of view, nuclear is a better option than coal. It's a riskier option, no doubt, if and when there is a nuclear accident. But when you compare it with coal, the nuclear option is a better option. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why governments, successive governments, have not abandoned nuclear power. They, in fact, said we must go ahead with nuclear power. Because we need electricity. If we use more coal, we will add to global warming. We will add to deforestation. We must have more solar power. We must have more wind power. But for base load, now hydropower, everybody says hydropower, but hydropower also has submergence, has displacement of people. And a lot of hydropower in India, one third of India's hydropower is in Arunachal Pradesh. One state of India has one third of India's hydropower. And Arunachal Pradesh is 2,000 kilometers away. You have to have long HVDC transmission lines coming in from Arunachal Pradesh. And if you build large dams, you induce seismicity. There have been earthquakes in India on account of reservoir induced seismicity. So hydro also has risks. So the point I want to make is, in the real world, no option is risk-free. You minimize the risks. You minimize the costs. And in the case of nuclear, because of the climate change argument, nuclear gets a premium, in my opinion. So we cannot abandon nuclear power, even though there are risks associated with nuclear power. Kurum Kulam was a past history. I don't think any government can repeat the Kurum Kulam experience. And you are seeing today, you are seeing protests in Haryana, you are seeing protests in Gujarat, you are seeing protests in Andhra. So people have become wise to nuclear power. They, they are, you know, following the time-tested NIMBY principle, not in my backyard. You know. Put a nuclear plant, but don't put it in our area. Your second question, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real danger now. It's a real danger. What has happened yesterday to the Ford Foundation uh, is not accidental because before that Greenpeace uh, was targeted. Then before that our Uday Kumar from Kurunkulam was targeted. So there is a deliberate attempt being made to stifle voices that may express dissent or a contrary point of view because the government feels that this adds to delays in projects. If you want quicker projects, we want quicker project implementation, so let's just stifle the opposition. But opposition will not run away. I think these are deep-rooted issues where people's livelihoods are concerned. And I think uh, no government, my government ignored Kurukur for too long. So in this, there is no difference between the previous government and this government. Uh, but I think in this government, there is a far greater degree of suspicion of civil society activists. And that, I think, will be detrimental uh, to them after a period of time, because they will find that this opposition cannot really be stifled. 
actually put my hand up over here to address your arguments, which I shall do, and then differ with you on the nuclear issue. To address the arguments, I believe to a certain extent, in the classical environmental sense, I'm also an environmentalist, you know, we tend to take an altruism, altruist perspective as against a self-interest perspective. I'll add a fifth point to you from a self-interest point of view. Today, growth is about quality of growth. It's about green growth. Though I don't know when, uh, whether when you were environment minister, you also waved the red flag in the UN whenever green growth is talked about. India continues to grow. But it's very clear we are a highly resource inefficient economy. Even compared to Asia, we take, we take about 11 to 12 units of imports to produce one unit of output. Asia is somewhere around 5, 6. Europe is around 2, 3. That argument needs to go much more strongly than these other arguments, which are we talked for a long time. And we need to talk about particularly to an audience that is here, because your lives will depend on the quality of growth, which you partly mentioned. The second point is, even countries like China are officially offsetting their GDP figures, not simply on the measurement issue. China is offsetting its GDP figures by 2% only for air pollution. These are public figures in the public domain. And forget the measurement part. Without the measurement part, we'll have to talk about offsetting our growth in terms of these issues. And I think that's something that you need to do in the next week around. But where you contradict yourself on the nuclear issue is, you talk one language on the measurement and how badly we are measuring, but you don't use that same argument with the way nuclear power is measured. Nuclear power is a favorite of an old Stalinist model of industrialization, in which the way nuclear power is measured obviously makes it less carbon footprint, this, that, other things. You don't measure the entire cycle. I'm a chemical engineer. In any engineering, you measure the entire process. What about the waste of nuclear energy? We don't talk about it at all. We only talk about the energy production. And that is why nuclear energy tends to be more favored than other forms of energy. But it's too late in the afternoon to get an argument, but I'm sure we meet quite often and talk about it. But I think the buttressing the argument about highly resource energy growth is necessary, particularly with this government, which doesn't seem to worry about the efficiency and quality of growth, but purely numbers. Thank you, Jan. No, I think on, we can have this debate separately, Lawrence. We'll, we'll agree to disagree. But all I want to say is, even on a full costing basis, even on a full costing basis, you compare the cost of extracting one ton of coal and using one ton of coal, and you cost of extracting one ton of one kg of uranium and using one kg of uranium, nuclear still comes out dead from pollution. There's no question in my mind. Coal has killed more people in India than nuclear. Now that's an outrageous statement. It's a fact. More people have died because of coal mining and breathing SO2 and NO2 and whatnot than from nuclear accidents. But I know I won't convince you. There are positions on this are, are you know, hard and fun. The, the, the non-democratic way our nuclear establishment has operated has added to the problem. Uh, there is no question we have a very well-known author sitting here who's written a biography of Vikram Saravan. Uh, Vikram Saravai was the only man I know who tried to bring in openness into the atomic energy establishment. And he got pilloried by everybody else for doing that. And till today, we have not been able to implement what Vikram Saravai wanted, which is an independent regulator for nuclear power plants. Today, the regulator for nuclear power plants reports to the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. How can you have a regulator reporting to the guy you're regulating? So these are structural problems in the way our nuclear is happening. But I don't think we should go away condemning nuclear power. We have one question there. The federal rule of the country, we should by bypass the democratic institutes like say Grand Panchayat for uh, establishing uh, nuclear power plants, which we need for increasing electricity. 
In the past they have. Now they can't. I have given you examples. I have given you examples. GE is put, when Mr. Obama was here, there was an agreement to sign, there was an agreement signed with Mr. Modi for two nuclear power plants. One nuclear power plant in Andhra with uh, GE and one nuclear power plant in uh, Gujarat for Western House. And both of them have run into public protests. They've run into public protests on land acquisition, they've run into protests on uh, environmental pollution. Now when Mr. Modi went to Paris, he signed an agreement with the French for the Jaitapur nuclear power. It was immediately opposed by the Shiva Sena and by various local civil society organizations, like the Kokwin Bachansan. So gone are the days in which governments can override override local sentiment and locate nuclear power. I think governments will have to you know, be a little more sensitive and you may end up not having that plan. POSCO, I don't know whether you've been following, you must be following since you've been to Bita Kadari Karika, uh, you've been following the POSCO debate. This was going to be India's biggest FDI, biggest FDI, $12 billion. And they have not been able to lay one brick on the ground for the last environmental clearance was given to them in the year 2010, for the last five years. Not one brick on the ground because the local people are against it. Seven villages, six villages are for it. One village is against it, India. And because of that one village, this POSCO can't set up this steel plant. In the olden days, that one village would have been bought over. But today they can't do it. So I think the democracy argument in India is going to be far more visible than you and I think it will be. More and more people will be visible you can say that they are asking for more compensation, they are asking for jobs, they are asking for better local engagement, whatever it is. But I do not think that any government <coughs> will be able to locate a Kulam or a POSCO without <coughs> taking local objections and local sentiments into account. There's a question. Uh, it's, I just want to make a quick comment. I just that I should object to your capitalism or the Gandhi Inquisition as no electricity. It's both flippant and, and historically wrong. I mean, Which one, sorry? Your characterization of the Gandhi Inquisition as no uh, electricity is both flippant and, and grossly historically wrong because I think it stems from a long history of, art, of a misunderstanding or a misapprehension of what Gandhi's position and many of these questions we really represented. And it points, it's also ties in with what was sort of missing in your knowledge over that presentation, which is the question of distributive justice. So you talk about growth, you talk about managing growth with all the checks and balances that you want to have in place, and you do touch upon the environmental and ecological, human ecological consequences. But the main fundamental question with, if you go back to the history of the 30s and 40s onwards, is really got to do with the notion of distributive justice, which is why that very question came up that day, Gandhi and people like Nisi Kumar and others took up. So uh, I've seen this characterization of yours in written material too, in terms of what Gandhi's position of patent planning was and so on and so forth. Uh, if I may humbly suggest, we need to spend some time and really uh, understand where his argument came from. No, I think, you know, don't get me wrong. The Gandhian position, when I said what I said on the Gandhian position, it was to tell you that Gandhi had a position that would have been fundamentalist in nature. He would have raised the question, why this demand for electricity? Where do you get that? Why would you have this demand for electricity? Can't you do without electricity? Where do you Can't you? That is Kumarupa. No, that is Kumarupa. I'm sorry, that, that comes from a rather poor reading of what they really represent. But these are questions that Mr. Gandhi asked. We can't run away from no, this no. He questioned the model of development. 
question the model of development, he also questioned the model of development in terms of it being truly democratic and truly decentralized. Agreed. But I mean, he, he, he questioned a model of development which was based on increasing consumption. Yes or no? You no, did. but also distribution. Yeah, I agree. I, I, there's no disagreement with you on that. There's no disagreement. So the fundamental point that Mr. Gandhi, by the way, Mr. Gandhi may have had a different point of view now because it's, we can't freeze him in time. The view that he had then would well saying, be a different point I, of view I now. But the more. point of view is there is a Gandhian point of view which questions, I have dealt with this for so long, I respect that point of view. But I, that point of view is not reflective of the increasing desire for consumption in our society. And no government can be insensitive to the needs of people whose aspirations have changed. There is no... That's the point is, I mean. I don't want to take on... I mean, I'm happy to take this offline because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to take it. I just want to say that it is not about the wider questions and imperatives at this point today, but your caricature is is grossly misleading, and that's the only no, point. It's linked with distributive justice. I have no... It's just completely no missing from what your arguments are, because really, you know, that's really at the core of the issue, because can you possibly sustain the levels of growth that you're talking about, which you're taking as a given, axiomatically? I take it as a given. I take and it as a given. Yes, I take it as a given. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. No, let me just finish. I'll tell, tell you why. I take it as a given. Can I just finish? That what you're thinking is axiomatic. There's a whole serious argument saying that that is not possible without all the consequences that you believe can be mitigated. I take it as a given because you know I uh, I belong. I am part of the system. I'm not about to change the system. I'm part of the system. I'm part of a political system which has to respond to a certain need which we see that there is a need for distributive justice goes without saying, but there is also a need, whether I like it or not, there is a need for private vehicles, there is a need for more electricity, there is a need for more resource intensive modes of consumption. The best I can do is to ensure that those needs are met in a sustainable fashion. But if I start asking fundamental questions of why this need, then I'm afraid I will not be able to take this debate forward. That's the point. I am not insensitive to the needs of distributive justice at all. It is fundamental. And to the extent that our democratic system allows those distributive questions to be answered, it has not been answered in the last 60 years. There is glaring inequality in the distribution of assets. There is glaring inequality in consumption needs as well. What do we do? This is the system that we have. It goes back to the question that here, it goes back to the system that we have. And you can say that what at best what I'm doing is tinkering on the margin. Yeah, I agree. I plead guilty to that. Uh, uh, anyway, now uh, we have we have a limitation of time. No, no I think uh, there, there are two others there. There's a limitation of time. Mr. Jairam Ramesh has to leave at 12:30, so we'll take three quick questions. So there is one there, one there, and you have a question. Okay, there are two there. You can go ahead. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. This is relating to your experience as a policy maker. Uh, we've been reading reports about environmental ministry uh, delaying clearances. So, uh, let's say, setting up an industry, there is a demand from one ministry about generating job employment, while one ministry wants to protect the environment. Uh, as, I mean, just looking at your experience, what, uh, how do you handle this kind of situation? Then, yours, yeah, ask your question. Yeah. Uh, so, you mentioned the uh, this thing of using the per capita number as an unfair thing because of India's large base. But uh, do you really think uh, it's a very unfair game India is playing by arguing with that because are the Western countries doing what they should be doing for the environment? So, uh, yeah, it might be unfair in arguing, but is, is the Western countries doing what they should be doing? Because maybe it's right for India to use unfair means to put the pressure. You can also ask your question. 
uh, just connected to this argument that uh, in our quest for economic growth with sustainability, how do we make sure that we won't drive India towards consumerism like Western economics? So that ends all the questions today, and he's going to give his answers. Can I just add to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, just an addition. Yeah, so the idea of consumption, first of all, why is it a given? I, I know it seems like that. Why is it a given? That people's aspirations, I do accept that, but if they're not created in a vacuum. They're created by the economic policies uh, followed, by media advertisements, for instance. They, they don't exist by themselves. They're also, you can choose to push them or not, depending on the policies that the government follows. So I, while I don't deny their aspirations, I'm just saying that they are also given a boost by certain policies. Okay, four questions very quickly. Let me deal with the per capita view. Uh, you know, the per capita is not an argument. It's a it's an empirical fact. So it's not an argument to be used. It's just a, it's a it's an artifact. It's a numerator denominated by a denominator that gives you a, a per capita argument. You're sure, the per capita emissions in the U.S. is 15 tons, and per capita emissions in India are two tons. Uh, does that reflect inequities internationally? Sure, it does. Uh, but why are we two tons? Have we asked ourselves that question? I mean, what you're saying is reproductive profligacy should give us a permanent advantage in all international You know an argument, the world does not pose anything for our reproductive profligacy. So, uh, we have to recognize that in the international context, this per capita argument is a non-starter. Last 20 years we have negotiated on this principle and we got no. So how do we get others to move? How do we take the leadership role? That's the issue. And the, the only way I saw when I was in charge of it for four and a half years, two years, was that you take leadership not by argumentation, you take leadership through action. But you you demonstrate that you are serious and you shame the other guys into doing what you expect them to do. So, in other words, you become a world leader in solar energy and then you can preach to the world the values of solar energy. You become a world leader in green energy, like the Chinese are doing or South Koreans are doing, and then you talk to the world. You cannot always be defensive and be behind the demographic protective umbrella because very soon the argument will come back to you of the distributive justice. But where is the distributive justice in this two tons per capita when you have 300 million people at 10 tons per capita and you have 500 or 600 million people not even having access to basic electricity? So there are lots of issues involved in this per capita argument. It's, it's a very convenient argument to take, but I would caution you against using that and sticking the entire argument on the per capita. It can be a, it can be a, it, it has to be a per capita plus. It cannot be just per capita. That's the, I think, essential point on per capita. How do you, uh, uh, how do you reconcile conflict? Yeah, conflicts are inevitable. Uh, the job of the Minister of Civil Aviation is to build airports. Uh, and his job is not to protect mangroves. Uh, the job of the Minister of Coal is to extract more coal. Uh, the job of the Minister of Environment is to ensure that the coal is mined in a manner that protects the environment. The job of the Minister of Environment is to ensure that the new Bombay airport comes and does not destroy the mangroves in New Mumbai. Now, how these conflicts get resolved is uh, you can have two models of conflict resolution. One model of conflict resolution is what I would loosely call the strongman model, you know, which is the top guy decides this is it. And so what's happening now, you know, this is it. This is the direction in which we want to move. The other model is a dirty model, you know, time-consuming model, acrimonious model, where you discuss, you leak letters to each other, uh, and then finally at the end of the exercise, you arrive at a compromise, which is what happened in many of the 
conflicts that took place, uh, whether it was on airports, whether it was on coal mining, whether it was in Jaitapur or Osco or Vedanta, so on and so forth. So there is a democratic way of uh, resolving these conflicts. It's a messy way. It's a time-consuming way. It's an acrimonious way. Uh, but the other way is uh, to say that, look, you know, I've heard all of you, and this is it. <laughs> Uh, the third question was uh, what is the conflicts that you know per capita? The third one was uh, question that you asked me was on? Sorry? Like uh, consumerism. Ah, consumerism. Yeah, yeah. See, you know, many years ago, there was a very famous Indian administrator, economic administrator, called Mr. Budhaliga. Yes, Budhaliga. Yes. He wrote an article in the Economic Times. There's a big debate going on in India about the capital goods model of development. Lawrence, uh, uh, capital goods model versus the wage goods model. So this is one of those things that economists get very excited about. <laughs> Nobody else can get excited. <laughs> <laughs> so, so both of you are wrong. I don't understand what this controversy is all about. Capital goods and wage goods. After all, Wage goods are goods that economists would like wage earners to buy, but they would themselves never buy. <laughs> and this is the problem with the world consumers. As long as it is with us, it's not consumers. As long as it's for the other guy, it becomes consumers. And short of a Stalinist dictatorial regime, which determines what is the consumption norm? Consumerism is inevitable. People's aspirations levels, people want to buy more, they want to consume more, they want better quality of life, they want, however much you and I, I'm not a votary of private education. I do not think that private education is in the country's interest, but over 40%, of poor families in UP and Bihar send their children to private schools. Can we run away from that reality? So consumerism is a fact of life. And it is a given, as far as I'm concerned. People who have who are walking will want cycles, people who have cycles want motorcycles, people who want motorcycles will buy nano cars, people who have nano cars will buy Marutis, and people who have Marutis will buy Honda. It's inevitable. Same thing with, uh, with clothes. The rich in India, I have to say this, the relatively better off in India wear Kali. The poor wear polyester. But polyester is consumerism in India. So I, it's a thing that I have come to deeply appreciate that consumerism is built in and we cannot fight the tides of consumerism. And you try to fight it, we're going to pay a very heavy electoral price. Ultimately, political parties have to respond, and political, no political party is going to say that uh, don't do this, don't do that, you have less of this, less of that. No political party, except the CPM and the CPI. You know, <laughs> grant them their ideological purity. They keep saying this. Amita's question. Huh? Amita asked. Yeah, yeah, Amita asked. I'll come to our question also. I'll come to, you know, it is a given because we are functioning in the real world, you know. We are functioning in the real world of going back to people every five years. But you're also deciding what they want. So I am not deciding what they want, sorry. I am not deciding that they want private schools. It's the people who want private schools. It is the first schools. You might not have the demand for private schools. You and I can argue for the rest of our lives on the need to improve municipal schools. But as long as you can't fire teachers for not attending schools, which is not possible in a public environment, you're not going to have good quality public school schools. 
the extraordinary situation I have seen in Gulbarga district of Karnataka, where a PhD, there's a private doctor, the doctor from the PhD has set up a private clinic next to the primary health center. The primary health center is deserted, but the private clinic is full. What about Tamil Nadu? Extraordinary situation. What about Tamil Nadu? Tamil, there is an exception to everything. <laughs> Kerala and Tamil Nadu are exceptions. Why? Why? Kerala and Tamil Nadu are exceptions. Generally exceptions. Generally. I mean, the examples. Uh, they are, by Indian standards, Kerala, Kerala is an exemption for a variety of reasons. Kerala has had political action. Kerala has had a very strong communist movement going back to the 50s. But Lawrence. Kerala also has the highest suicide rate in India. Alcoholism. Highest alcoholism in India. Highest suicide rate in India. And the highest migration rate out of India. If all these things are... I'm a great believer in the Kerala model. And the highest migration rate in Tibet. Internal, internal evidence is also yeah. Into it now. Into it. So consumerism. I mean, it's a given because... You can say public systems cannot be reformed. It's a conclusion that I have arrived at after 35 years of working in the government system. The structure of incentives and disincentives to economic agents and public systems being what they are, you are ne rarely going to get accountability. The fact that Kerala has done it, or Tamil Nadu has done it, to a large extent, in my view, there are factors peculiar to those two states, peculiar to those two states. And we can, have, we can discuss those factors. But in large parts of India, public systems have collapsed. We can try to fix those public systems. And how we can fix those public systems is a matter for a separate debate. And I have come to this conclusion that we really, people are demanding a certain consumption basket. Should you, is the job of the government to meet that consumption basket or not to meet that consumption basket? If we look at the Soviet Union, a great example of a agrarian economy that industrialized, produced missiles, produced hydrogen bombs, nuclear reactors, but couldn't produce enough potato and bread. So do you want that type of an economy? Fine, you can also run that type of an economy. Uh, for all things, we have to bring this to a close now. And uh, the fascinating talk, extraordinarily good questions, wonderful interaction, and most of you stayed the course. question answer session. So it is really, uh, we really appreciate that and it on a Saturday morning he took several hours off to come and interact with him here. Thank you, sir. And uh, this is the token of our appreciation. Uh, a book about ideas.